The title of my talk is, uh, the, or uh, the presentation, is The Stupefying Smart City. And it might seem to you that uh, I'm therefore going to give you a kind of anti-technology talk. But that's not the case. What I'm worried about is that with um, the technological tools that we have today, as in the past, uh, our first use of them is the least inventive that we can make. And the issue is how urbanists can actually use these new tools well, rather than um, uh, use them in, in a way which is harmful. This is, as I say in my paper, this has an old history uh, in the history of technology, the, the invention of the scalpel, took nearly a century for people to figure out how to use this super sharp knife in order to do better surgery. And I think the same thing is true for the technological tools that we have of, uh, at our disposal for the smart city. Uh, at present, uh, there are temptations to use them in ways which are stupefying to the populace in which the tool substitutes for the judgment of the urbanite. And that, I think, is something that we have to counter and that we can counter, um, that, that we're beginning to get a more sophisticated sense of how these tools could be used. Uh, but it's a policy choice, uh, and I'm, I'll try and lay that out to you. I, what I'd like to add to what I've written in the newspaper is the following. Um, you could think in a way of the issue here of what, um, what this technology can take away from people's capacity to reason, to feel, to make sense of complexity by posing the question, do you need a street to have street smarts? And my answer to that question is yes, that is to be a sophisticated, competent urbanite, you need a street. And I'd like to make that a little more um, technically clear to you what that means. In social psychology now, uh, there have been studies for the last 10 years about the ways in which people acquire um, a, an ability to think and feel both together uh, in, about complexity. The, and these are studies of transitions from adolescence into adulthood. And they focused on the ways in which adults become adult by being able to deal with uh, complexity. Um, and these studies have focused on three capacities. Uh, one is the uh, toleration of ambiguity uh, as a condition of, of adult cognition. The second is the ability to pursue incomplete action, that is to, to, uh, to bring something forward, to act on it, even though uh, the results are, say, 80% rather than 100%, or 51%, or even 30% of what you intended to accomplish. And the third uh, form of this adult cognition is what's called dialogics which is the ability to listen to what somebody means be behind the words that they use. And um, this is a real advance in understanding the sort of higher levels of dealing with complexity that um, human beings can acquire as adults. What the city does to these three forms of cognition about complexity is uh, propose that you can learn how to tolerate ambiguity, to pursue incomplete action, or to practice dialogics with strangers. That is that strangers will make you uh, more, st will stimulate you to practice these forms of cognition, and as I say, they're both rational and emotional, 
uh, more than being with people who are very familiar to you. So that there's, in principle, a kind of, uh, um, on the cultural, uh, psychological side, there's an intersection between the social condition of the city, potentially, and the process of becoming a sophisticated adult. Now, here's where the story I want to tell you enters in. Because we can use technology to disable this form, these forms of learning complexity. And in my paper, I've shown a couple of examples of, of how this can happen, of a, a, a use of technology that makes people more stupid. I, it's not quite a word I like, but it's a wonderful title. Uh, but in which something where people are not stimulated to deal with complexity in, in all of its forms because of the way in which we're thinking uh, technologically. Here, for instance, is Mazdar uh, in the United Arab Republic. Uh, it's a city planned with a tight fit between form and function. Uh, it's a very Fordist city in that way. For each function, there's a place and a form. And what that means is there's not much stimulation to think about difficulty uh, or to try and make sense of the relation between where and what. It's all been done in advance. Similarly, oh God, you, can, you can see here how it works. It's something that is contained within itself there are no fuzzy edges here. I'm sorry, I don't want to go back to the talk that Ricky Burdett has uh, accused me of being uh, very uh, um, uh, uh, philosophical about. But this is a boundary rather than a border. That is, the edges of this big giant building are the edges of where settlement ends. There's no periphery, there's no ambiguity in the space. And the space itself is something which is very directional in, in its social logic. You know exactly what's happening in each of the spaces uh, by, by the, the kind of architecture that's made for it. It's a very glitzy looking space, but it's a space that requires no interpretation. Now, this, uh, it's, uh, Mazda are extremely expensive. It's an experiment, as Saskia Sassen has pointed out, in how far you can push technology, and perhaps only the UAR could afford it. But uh, it's an experiment in Fordism. And this kind of uh, environmental Fordism, I want to argue to you, is a way of stupefying people, of depriving them of the spaces in which they develop those three street smarts of tolerance of ambiguity, incomplete action, uh, the, uh, the pursuit of action, uh, incomplete action, and dialogics. Now, here is Songdu, and this is another smart city. Let's see if there's another picture. Yeah, this is the one I like. Um, if I push, ah, it actually works. This piece of technology never works for me. Um, it looks beautiful in a way, but when you look here, you see something that I think for urbanists is a very, very important uh, problem. There is no horizontal value in this space. I don't mean simply that there aren't streets, but that the notion of horizontality is been removed from the space. It's a deprivation. You, you don't go out here. Everything's contained in the building. Some of that has to do with the climate of uh, South Korea, which is, which is uh, harsh. But Koreans typically have made, uh, overcome it, their climate and used the horizontal with basements. They've been very clever about using uh, below ground as a kind of uh, horizontal. And the horizontal is a way of extending out uh, uh, encounters with other people. There is, this is a space of, de in my view, of deprivation because it has no streets. 
You can't develop street smarts when you've taken away half of the visual vector of what people need uh, uh, for, for their experience of other people. So this is uh, the model of a, uh, these buildings each have a, f have a function and people are stacked up in them again according to the Fordist principle of you, you go where you belong, you are never where you don't belong. Uh, here's another part of it built up. You can see there's no really meaningful, uh, there's no meaningful street here for human beings. By contrast, and I just bring this in this third avenue, um, uh, it's not a, actually a bad cafe too, a cinema cafe. <laughs> Uh, but apart from the virtues of, it has fantastic espresso, real espresso, but let's, we won't go into that. This is a space in Third Avenue where the building typology vertically is as monotonous as this. I, I'm showing you um, uh, it's an older building, but the vertical typology is terrible. But at the ground plane, the idea is that while up is, is pretty much uniform, that the ground plane is something that's uh, disorderly, confused, ambiguous, incomplete, that needs to be read and needs to be interpreted. And my argument to you as, as urbanists is that what we've got to do in using this technology is figure out ways in which we do not abolish the, the horizontal ground dimension. It's the dimension of complexity, such as we know it today. Now, I want to show, oops, yeah. Uh, Songdu and Mazdar represent, I think, ways of simplifying the city, even with its enormous technical complexity, uh, simplifying the space of the city and making people unable to access uh, this, this kind of mature development along these three axes that I've, I've, I've indicated. I just, as a counter to this, want to say something about Rio de Janeiro, which has used the information capacity gathering. This is a wonderful project pursued by IBM and Cisco to do coordination of what's happening in the city rather than a kind of pre-planning of what should happen. Uh, this is a completely different model of, of technological use, one in which the technology deals with complexity on the ground rather than tries to preclude it through over-planning and over-design. Um, this is sometimes known as the headache room, and you can understand all those screens represent traffic blocks, uh, uh, points where people have to get through to, um, uh, uh, where ambulances have to get through and, and so on. In other words, they represent spaces in the city to which the technology is reactive, trying to enable What's, uh, what's happening on the ground. And to me, this seems like a much more useful tool in thinking about how to take technology forward than thinking about uh, the central uh, processing systems that we now have as prescriptive. This is coordinative rather than prescriptive use of technology. And I think that's the way forward for us as urbanists, that we have to think more in that line than about how to make the city uh, resemble um, a, a well-oiled, well-functioning machine. If we do that, we take away, as it were, the genius of the city that makes people competent urbanites. Thank you very much.